Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only access, and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful, so very thankful for just who you are and all that you've done in our lives. Help us, Lord, to grow in grace and knowledge of you. Open our eyes to the truth that you would have us know. Filter out all the foolishness. Seal to our hearts truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Philippians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had reached the end of the second chapter. We've looked at the, the fact that the Holy Spirit's interest is centered in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that our Lord longs to be with us. We long to be with Him, but He also longs to be with us. That God has a purpose in our being here. That uh, if there was no purpose, we wouldn't be here. That He was given, Christ was given as our example of submission and obedience. The, the Holy Spirit is with us, guiding and directing us. That and that without him, without the Holy Spirit, there is no, there can't be any like-mindedness. There, there's no interest in the things of the Lord separate from the Holy Spirit. And that he works through us. And that our lives is Christ. Paul says, uh, for to me to live is Christ. I've mentioned before, folks, how that that as we go through Paul's epistles, which is the very lifeblood of the church, not only do we see something dramatically uh, taking place uh, that is so far different than what we we read in the Gospels, which was prior to Christ being crucified, before the beginning of the church, when Christ came preaching. The kingdom to his people and even though uh, the dispensation is different he came unto his own and his own received him not and there's a lesson in that for all of us today the reason they didn't receive him was because and the reason that they confronted him the reason that that opposition existed in the first place was basically, I mean, you could almost sum it up uh, and, and, and say that in a nutshell, Christ, the, the very fulfillment of the law, you know, the, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. They couldn't see past the law to see Christ. And the same, the same, the same is true today. Nothing's changed. You know, perhaps our wardrobe has changed and the times have changed and, you know, there's been quite an advancement in technology and the world has changed, but people's hearts have not changed. Religion has not changed, whether it's pagan, whether it's so-called Christian. The whole idea of a relationship with God based on the concept of gaining merit or favor with God is not what we're reading or we're going to read it's not what we've been reading and it's not what we're going to read in the text without him there's no like-mindedness there's no interest in the things of the lord and so as we begin in chapter th three we haven't left the dominant theme of the epistle and we haven't left the dominant theme of the entire new Te new testament which is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The person and the work of Jesus Christ. Folks, I want to, I would love to, to if, if I could, and I don't see how I can, I would love to just be able to sit here and say for the next 30 minutes, over and over again, over and over again, so that people will, so that it will maybe perhaps sink into people's thinking in a serious way 
that our focus is on the person and the work of Jesus Christ, not ourselves. Which is, is basically the, the focus of much of, of Christianity today. It's on sin, it's on self, it's on the law, but it, it, is, it is not on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now that may be a difficult concept for you to grasp, but it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to open our eyes and look around us and see that that's exactly the case. The dominant theme of today's preaching is the obedience of the Christian, not the obedience of Christ. You know, which doesn't make any sense to me. If God's dominant theme is the person in the work of Christ, then I'm persuaded that that must be the dominant subject of my preaching and yours. Christ is our message. Christ is our life. Not self. That's why you don't see a lot of flashy stuff thrown up on the screen here. I, I believe that I could almost deliver a 30-minute message here on this YouTube channel through one of these videos and never accentuate any words whatsoever, no without em emphasizing any one particular word, without elevating my voice to another level, without any of that. And I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit will work in the lives of those whom he has opened their eyes to see the truth. That it doesn't, it's not about the persuasion of, you know, if, well, if I could just, you know, somehow... You know, uh, I would reach more people if I could just, so you know, throw a whole lot more pizzazz into these videos. And folks, look, I know uh, for most of you, the the last thing that we want to do is go back to school. Okay, you know, it's, I've been what well, it's been many years since I graduated high school. That's the last thing we want. It's the last thing that really Christians want. They they don't want to spend a whole lot of time in this book. But if it is your desire to draw nearer to God, the God who has placed you so near to him, then that's what we've got to do. What I believe God wants us to see here in, in, in what I'm about to, 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 to put up here on the screen for as we go into the, the third chapter of this amazing epistle it, and it's one of my favorite epistles it's always been because it, it does center upon the person and the work of Christ so uh, glaringly uh, what I believe he wants us to see here is it's is not it's not our obedience it's uh, it's not our submission okay to moral laws, but a revelation, a, a submitting ourselves to a revelation given us of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I believe that the predominant, the predominant theme of submission is not submission to moral laws, ethical laws, or spiritual laws, but submission to the grace of God, the grace of God. I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, meaning we are to walk equal to who we are in the finished work of, of Christ. Now, I recognize that we're to put away lying and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But look at the context of that word lie or lying, and you'll find out that it it is a lying against the truth. It's lying to one another. Okay, if we're if you're living under law, if your message is law, if your focus is on sin and, and on self and law keeping as a rule of life, 
If that's your message, then it's, it's a lie. And we're to put away lying to one another. And we are to deal in truth with one another. And I believe that at least uh, for the to a great extent, I believe that Blessed Hope Forever does that. Now, does that mean that, uh, that that you should believe everything I say? No. Does that believe? Does that mean that that I believe that we have that I really have, I've got this handle on the truth? I just you know I've, I've really got it down, and I know. No, it's, I'm not saying that at all. Okay. What I am saying is that we are to be submissive first and foremost. To the grace of God, because we are not under law, but we're under grace. And we've seen that all through, not just this epistle, but in every other epistle that we've studied through. And we're getting ready here to look at something that is very, I, I wish I could think of the right word. Straightforward would be a good way to, to put it. So we're going to. We're going to really start into chapter 3, and we're going to look at, at, at where we're going here, with uh, given uh, everything that we've looked at uh, before. I think that one aspect of submission is that it's never it's about that whole idea of, of obedience and submission. It's, it's, it, it's never, it's, it never do you hear it stressed that this is a submission to grace. And that's the subject of, of this next paragraph. We all know that if a thing is worth having, it's worth working for. I've, I, I was raised that way. You all know we live in a world, we live in a society where that, that's just that's taught over and over again. You know, we, we set goals, we work for them. You know, you know, the man that produces is the man that wins. And, and, and you know, you see that in sports, you see that in, in the workplace, you see that just in in all of human life okay all of those things make sense in the world that we live in it makes sense in industry it makes sense in 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 sports com competitive sports it makes sense in human life but in the word of god we are not blessed because we obey and yet that's what i hear preached day after day i turn on so-called christian television every once in a while as long as i can stand it and i hear it said over and over again that it, it, that if i give if i if i pray if i serve god will bless me and i open this book and i read that god blesses me because he loves me and i could put that in the past tense and be absolutely correct god has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in christ okay we're lacking we're coming behind in no spiritual grace The question is, is do you believe that? Do you believe God concerning that? Because if you do, it makes all the difference in the world. God blesses me because he loves me. He hit, God hid me in the Lord Jesus Christ. That I'm as close to God as, as I could ever be. And that by grace. If you, if you do not know that you are as righteous as Jesus Christ, that when the Father looks down upon you, he sees you as righteous as his Son, that he loves you as much as he does his Son, if you don't understand that, if you don't believe that, then you have no other recourse but to walk according to the flesh. Okay? And folks, grace can be a difficult concept to grasp. It was meant to be. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. I want you to know, now that word finally, uh, it's, you could translate that moreover or furthermore. It's not, like, it's not like finally in the sense that, well, Paul's coming to the end of the epistle or he's, he's running out of things to say. This is the, uh, he's wrapping it all up here by saying, you know, finally. That's, not, that's the English word, but it really means just furthermore. Okay? Rejoice in the Lord. And he calls us brethren. We're family. 
These are God's people he's talking to. He's telling God's people, rejoice in the Lord. The passage does not begin, rejoice in the fact that you accepted the Lord. You know, rejoice in the fact that you obey the Lord. Rejoice in the fact that you're a Christian. The, the passage begins, rejoice in the sphere of the Lord, in the area of the Lord, in the person of the Lord. Okay? And, and just as a reminder, there's, there's no chapter divisions in the original line, in the manuscripts. So as we come out of chapter 2 into chapter 3 here, everything is, stands upon what was written before. Rejoice in the Lord. You know, it's similar to our passage in Colossians. If you remember, if you, if you then be dead with Christ, if you then be risen with Christ, set your affection on things above, not on the things on the earth. Well, what are those things? Is that, you know, going to movies, uh, playing poker on Sunday? You know, the things on, on the earth, folks, is the flesh, law. Everything is in a Christian context. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to Christians here. He was talking to Christians in Colossians. This book was written to us, his people. Okay? In fact, folks, the New Testament has little to say to, directly to the non-believer. Oh, it says a lot about the non-believer, but it, it is not written to the, the non-believer. It is written to the believer in Christ, God's people. Okay, it, it doesn't really have anything to say to the non-believer except for judgment. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but, but for you it is safe. Now that word, the word not in the Greek is the absolute negative, okay, for those of you who are familiar with the Greek. It's not grievous. It's not burdensome. Okay? For you, it is safe. So this is the construction of violent contrast. This is not... A, it's the, the small word, not, but it's, it has a... It packs a powerful punch. Now, this is not a problem for me at all. This doesn't hurt me. It don't hurt me to repeat this over over and over and over again and for you it is safe why is it safe why is it safe because if you are not rejoicing in the lord you're going to fall back to law you're not going to submit to grace you know we all talk about obedience and, and submission as, as obeying god you know we give we serve we witness we go to you know you know who knows where you know to, uh on some missionary journey. Uh, we go to far-flung areas, you know, of the world. To, to, and we give up this and we give up that. And I tell you, folks, and I, you know, I do not believe that any Christian ever has to give up anything for grace. Okay? And yet I hear it so many times. You know, if you don't give up this, that, or the other thing, you know, you name it, just fill in the blank. You know, if you don't, if you don't do, if you don't give up this or that or the other thing, then you can't be saved or you can't be a Christian, you know, or you can't do this or that or the other thing. Folks, that is not the case at all. You don't give up anything for Christ. Now, now, some things may give you up because you're a new creation in Christ, but you rejoice in the Lord. If you don't rejoice in the Lord, then you fall back to law. I think I mentioned I was going to try to, at least if we're still here, get, move on into Galatians after Philippians and, and in Galatians, in the book, the epistle to the Galatians, you know, certain people came and they said, oh, oh, well, you know, this is all well and good. You know, grace, oh, grace is a wonderful thing. It's a marvelous thing, but you got to be circumcised. You got to keep the law. You know, I, I, dearly beloved.
Christians today, they loudly proclaim that they are preaching grace, but the undertone of the message is, well, you must be circumcised and, and keep the law. Well, are you telling me, Pastor, that, that you don't believe that baptism is the New Testament sacrament, uh, the sacrament that uh, the ordinance that uh, replaced circumcision? No, I'm absolutely not saying that. I don't think there are, there are any sacraments. The new covenant is not lived by commandments and rules, but by grace. And if you don't rejoice in the sphere of the Lord, then the only place to go, the only place left for you to go is law. Law. And we are not under law, but we're under grace. Be aware of the dogs, be aware of the evil workers, and be aware of the concision. All three are articulated. Okay? And so we're going to look at that. Now, you Greek students out there who are, are familiar with the Greek at all, you know that the word for, for cut is, in the Greek, the word for cut is tome. Tame, that's the word for cut, cut, tame. And peri, where we, we get our word perimeter, peri is a Greek word for around, okay? Therefore, peri tame is the word for circumcision, to cut around. But the word in verse 2 is tame. Cut against. Mutilate. These people, folks, were mutilating themselves spiritually. Okay, not physically, but spiritually. They were mutilating themselves. They were taking grace and they were saying it, it, it's ineffective. It's, it's not enough. You know, uh, Be aware of the mutilators, and all three are articulated. The dogs, the evil workers, the mutilators. Now, if we didn't know anything about the context here, if we didn't know anything about it, the context whatsoever, we can talk about these people as horrible, moral. I mean, they're, they're, they are the most morally depraved people. They are the pornographic off-scouring of society, all right? But who are the dogs? Who are the dogs? Now, I realize that the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm aware of the fact that he said that the dogs eat the crumbs from their master's table. But that's a different word than this one. Different word. When the Lord came... Well, when the Lord used the word dog, he talked about the, you know, the there he, he was talking about the little fox terrier or the chihuahua or whatever, you know, you know, one of those little pets that you baby in the house. All right. The word here is the wild dog, the dog without a master, the dog without a master. Okay. Different word. The dog that wants to devour. The question here is, are these the morally depraved segment of society? Not at all. Not at all. They are highly religious. The so-called dedicated to God religious community who believes we are to live according to law. Now, you may not like hearing that, but that's what our text is saying. This passage, folks, is no exhortation against moral depravity, but of spiritual depravity, of departing from the sphere of the Lord, from the area of grace to the area of law, when we're not under law, but under grace. You know, to, to keep the law in order to gain merit with God is to blaspheme. I've, I've said this in, in a great number of videos. Blaspheme. That's how serious this is. 
These dogs were out devouring something that was not theirs. They were without a master. And we are to be aware of these. I, it is my belief, and I, you know, there's, I don't, not everyone shares this belief, but it is my belief that we have little time left to realize, folks, just how important it is to submit ourselves to the grace of God. It is, it is the very foundation upon which this ministry pivots, okay? It is important. I, I, don't, I, don't, I think important is too weak of a word. It's vital that we understand that we are not under law, but we're under grace, and that we are submit. Uh, Sub, we are to submit ourselves to the grace of God. That, that, can, that can be difficult because we live in a body that's just racked with sin. But that's what we're told to do. That's what we're told to do. You are righteous because God made you righteous if you were, well... Yeah, and it doesn't matter what you think. Well, I don't think I'm righteous. Well, if, if you belong to Christ, if he died in your place, you are righteous. You are just as righteous as he is. And that is an unchangeable position in Christ, that, you, that you've been placed, positioned in Christ, that you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You had nothing to do with that. You know, you're saying, well, I, you know, I, if you say, well, you know, I'm not, I don't think I'm righteous. I'm, as, I'm not as righteous as, as Christ. I haven't been made the righteousness. I'd love to be made the righteousness of God in Christ, but I, I don't think I have it. You got the whole wrong idea about, about what that means, what that's saying. You know, somehow you've been led to believe that, that, uh, that's it's something that, that you have to accomplish on your own or accept on your and and just because you don't ex, you know if you don't accept a certain truth as true doesn't mean that 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 truth may not be true of you ah uh, you know you're dead to sin well i don't feel dead to sin you're not under law well i don't feel like i'm uh, uh under anything but law doesn't matter how you feel, folks. What matters is what this book says. Back in, in Romans, the fifth chapter of Romans, you can't read that and say, well, I don't, th I don't think I want to be made a sinner. You know, by the disobedience of the one Adam, the many were made sinners. And, and you can't say, you can't read that and you can't say, well, I don't think I want to be made a sinner. You can't do that. You were made a sinner in Adam. You didn't have anything to do with it. And in exactly the same way, the many will be made righteous in Christ. And you say, well, well, what that means is, is if you accept, you're made righteous. If you receive, you're made righteous. If you believe, you're made righteous. But now wait a minute. The text just told us that we couldn't do anything about being made a sinner in Adam. Well, the verse says, even in the same way we were made righteous by the obedience of Christ. Well, yeah, St Steve, yeah, but you have to believe. Don't say that. Doesn't say that. No, you have to receive. Doesn't say that. You're not righteous because you believe. You are not righteous because you received. The devils believe and tremble. You were made righteous by the obedience of Christ, not because you received it, not because you believed it, not because you accepted it, but because the family of God was made a sinner by the disobedience of Adam. So the family of God was made righteous by the obedience of Christ. That's what the book says. And the very first command, the very first that you'll find, okay, in the New Testament, the very first command, that is ever given to you in the epistles, the very first imperative mood 
That's a command in the, in the Greek grammar. The, the first one that you could possibly find is given you, to you, in the epistles. It's given you in Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you want to, do you really want to obey God? If, if, if you say, I want to obey God and, and ignore the very first command given you, then I would, I would have to, to question whether or not you really want to obey God. Dearly beloved, listen. The verse says, even in the same way as you were made a sinner in Adam, you were made righteous by the obedience of Christ. And the, oh, I, I, I've, I've done videos on this, on that verse, that Romans 6, 11, reckon, it's, it's, a, it's legizomai, it's a, counting it as, as true. You know, and I, I've heard people say, well, Steve, I tried that. It didn't work for me. You know, I tried reckoning myself dead to sin. And notice there's two parts to that. There's, you know, A and B. You know, Romans 6, 11, A, Romans 6, 11, B. One is reckoning yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You don't function out of the old man, folks. You function out of the new. We function out of the new man, not the old. God has nothing to do with the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. Now, this may come as a shock to some of you. The, the first command is not obey God. The first command is not serve God. The, the first command is not preach the gospel. The first command is not save souls or any other, other command that you want to make it. The very first command, the one supremely important to God, obviously, is that you recognize the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you haven't done that, if you have not done that, folks, Everything else, listen, dearly beloved, everything else, if you have not done that, then everything else is mutilation. We calculate ourselves, reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. And to repeat these things to me is not burdensome, but for you, it's safe. You know, I've got to repeat these things because I, I don't know enough to keep coming up with something new. Why are you dead to sin? Because you calculated it? No, because you are dead to sin. And what God wants you to do is recognize that being submissive to the truth that you are dead unto sin is a more important aspect of submission than it is not to rob banks. Well, I, I must have lost half my, my viewers right there. These views of, on these videos have gone down increasingly. As, as truth is increasingly presented, as more grace is being brought forth, as, as more of Christ is being preached, not self, the views go down. It is a testimony, folks, to the very fact that what I'm saying is the truth. That what, that what God is saying in this book is true. Yet, yeah, the truth of all this is, I don't hear that preached. If you can't comprehend the finished work of, of Christ, you're spinning your wheels in mud, folks. Actually, you're causing your fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, you're, you are causing those harm, causing believers harm, those for whom Christ died. You're causing them harm, okay? And I don't mind telling you that. Just take a look around you. You who do understand 
what the text is saying here. It's not hard for you to look around and see a lot of believers hurting today. They're despondent. They're hurting. They're discouraged. There's a feeling of hopelessness. This, the law will never give you any blessed hope, folks. Okay? Only God's grace will. To repeat these things to me is not burdensome, not grievous, but for you it's safe. Oh, I love the Lord Jesus Christ, you say, and, and he did almost enough, you know, and if I could just pitch in there and, and do a little bit more, then we, man, we got this thing licked. Maybe I'm talking too much like a okay here, but you know, this, these are the things I've heard. Folks, that's mutilation. Chapter 3 does not begin, okay? You know, furthermore, let me tell you what you ought to do as Christians and then list a whole lot of do's and don'ts. It, it's because the Christian community refuses to grapple with grace that we have the Big Ten or the 12-step or the formula, you know, to, to, for success. The, all of the self-help books that are written on the Christian bookshelf, by the way, I'm talking about self-help books. Law. This is the age we live in. Don't let this surprise you, folks. This is the age that we are living, in which we are living. Little different from back in the first century when the church began. The same problem exists today that existed then. It's just nowadays it's it's you know, you know there's there's been things that have changed, but basically it's the same. And it always will be. You know, it was a major breakthrough really for me to when I was a boy, when my mother finally said, well, I could, you know, I could go to a movie and still go to heaven. But not on a Sunday. You know, I expect to see her in glory. But I doubt that she would have agreed with what I'm saying to you today when it came to our being dead to the law. Dearly beloved, God says to you and to me, Rejoice in the Lord. In the Lord. Not your obedience, not your walk, not your life, not your law keeping, not your rules, not your regulations, but rejoice. That is, and the word rejoice, okay, is to de delight in God's grace. <laughs> Folks, it, it, I read your comments some of the, that you leave here, and, and I see you're rejoicing in God's grace. It, it, the word rejoice literally means to experience God's favor, to be consciously glad for His grace. You, we rejoice in Christ Jesus, the Lord. And we are to be aware of those who would mutilate grace. Folks, you must see in the second verse, not moral depravity, but spiritual error. Paul is writing to a church. We are of the circumcision, okay? This is now, now this is the real word for circumcision, all right? And if you read Greek, the play on words here is really interesting. We're not mutilators. We are the real circumcision who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The true circumcision, which are worshiping God, by the Spirit. These aren't horribly impure, you know, uh, moral people, but people who are worshiping God, folks, in the flesh. And I'm persuaded that most of Christianity is trying to make the flesh acceptable to God, and it is not acceptable to God. It never will be. God, God gets 
exactly what God anticipated to get from the flesh. That's nothing but evil. All right, nothing but sin. The new man, the new man, dearly beloved, that is the area of our worship. And if you try to bring the old man into your worship, you're in a terrible mess. You're among the mutilators. We worship in the area of the new man who has the mind of God, the Holy Spirit, the mind of Christ. Folks, we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We have the mind of Christ. I think I, I remember pointing out to you folks that, uh, two to three years ago, you know, that the problem with your children, why you must raise your children under law is because they don't have the mind of their father. Okay, you mothers out there who give birth to a child who has the mind of, of the father, well, you, and then you, know, you don't have to worry about the law. You know, the, the, t the kid's got the mind of the father. He's going to do everything the father wants. So why pass any laws? The trouble is when you give birth to a child, that child does not have the mind of his parents. Therefore, he must be raised under, under the law. I want to read Galatians 4, some, a few verses, I think about 10 or 12 verses here. Galatians 4, chapter 1, or starting at verse 1 of chapter 4. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the, under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Folks, the world was the law system then. The world is the law system today. Okay? Unless you're a, a planetary scientist, unless you're a geologist or, or you know, a planetary phys a scientist or, you know, I don't know, some. And, and the world to you means this round ball that's, that we call terra firma. The world here in this book, folks, is the world religious system based upon merit. It's the world that will hate you, put you out of the synagogue, sacrifice you to God thinking it's doing God service. And you, have, you are not under law. You've never been under law, ever, folks. Okay? No Christian at any time since Pentecost has ever been under the law. It was not given to you and to me. You were made righteous by the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ, not by your works. Therefore, we are the true circumcision. It is a spiritual circumcision. We worship God by the Spirit of God, and we rejoice in the finished work of Christ, and we have absolutely, absolutely not placed any confidence in the flesh or any trust in the flesh. The contrast in verse 3 makes it very apparent that verse 2 are the good deeds of the flesh, not immoral actions. We are commanded to guard against the good deeds of the flesh to gain merit with God. That's what you're guarding against. Okay? For our fellowship and communion with God is in the Spirit. And it's a perfect tense. 
Okay, we have reached a settled persuasion that we have no confidence, no trust whatsoever in the flesh. Hard to live under law when we've seen so matter-of-factly Israel's failure to keep the law. An entire nation couldn't keep it, and you think as one individual you, you're going to? Have you come to understand the very purpose of the law? Why the law was given? To show man's sinfulness. Not to make him righteous. It was never intended to make us righteous. It was never given to the church to begin with. The new covenant is not some new enhanced version of the old covenant. Well, you know, we got the old covenant, now we got the new covenant. So, you know, we got to, you know, carry over everything from the old covenant into the new covenant. And it's a, it's a mishmash of both old and new. And, you know, because we don't, you know, God forbid, you know, we, we do away with the old covenant. No, it's law, old covenant, uh, you know, Old Testament, law, New Testament, grace. But, but now we got to mix the two. How much time, folks, have you spent in this book to find out, to learn, to discover, okay, that the law was never given to the church to begin with, that, when, that all righteousness is of the Lord. He's the source of it all. <coughs> and that our righteousness, our, our best efforts are the best that you could do, okay, the best you could throw out there is as filthy rags. Do you understand that Christ is the fulfillment of the law? Okay. And he lives inside you. Do you understand that Christ is the end of the law to, for righteousness to, to everyone who believes? That's everyone. Okay. Not just a select few. And that law-keeping drives us to Christ who is our life. These mutilators, hopefully they'll be driven to Christ. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Uh, I, I, I just almost want to apologize for, for not being able, it seems, to... to spark more interest you know in in the viewers of these videos more interest in in the fact that Christ our, our lives here folks are a little different than what they're going to be really in glory I, I mean in the sense that we have an an entire eternity to look forward to okay in glorifying christ in praising christ rejoicing in the lord okay praising him for all he is and all he's done in our lives what sense does it make to live our lives here as christians believing that we have to Not only make ourselves acceptable to God, but keep ourselves that way. It makes no sense whatsoever. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all your comments. Thank you for all your support. I appreciate your prayers for the direction of this ministry as well as my health. I want you all to know I pray for you constantly. Until next time, rest in Him. And thanks for watching.